Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Facebook Live. My name is Noor Hasham Waz, president and founder of Build Dream, and I'm so thrilled to have our special guests with us today to talk about the amazing career pathways in manufacturing and focusing specifically on becoming Becoming a CNC machinist. Um, it's been a while since we've been on Facebook Live, so we're really glad to be back. Um, and I want to introduce Rod Jones from WBLC, who has an amazing initiative that he's going to talk about uh, today. Um, and they have reached out to Build a Dream to support their initiative in recruiting more female applicants in the GTA area to enter the manufacturing sector and become CNC machinists. And I thought, what better way to highlight this amazing opportunity than to call on two of my favorite CNC machinists, um, Elizabeth Moses and Rebecca Chenier, who um, are doing great work in the manufacturing sector and are great advocates to get more women into the sector. So I just want to welcome you all to our Facebook Live. Thank you. Thanks for so, having me. Rod, let's first start. I'm so glad to have you back. I know I've interviewed uh, Rebecca and Elizabeth and we had great discussion about your particular career pathway. Um, but as you know, you both entered this career through uh, a government funded program through Women's Enterprise Skills Training of Windsor and through St. Clair College that provided you the opportunity to not only explore this pathway, to train and then to get a um, placement with industry and years later you're working and thriving in your career and so I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about the initiative that WBLC is leading through um, ROD and to talk to uh, females in the GTA area along with across the province because I think there's government funded programs across the province um, that are encouraging more women to go into the manufacturing pathway. So Rod, how about we first start off with hearing more from you about what program you're trying to promote and why it's really important for you now to recruit more female applicants. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Noor. The, uh, this initiative got started uh, basically with companies who couldn't find enough uh, skilled help to fill the job vacancies that they had. Uh, that's a situation that we've had for many years uh, and it continues for all kinds of reasons. Um, so our program is different than many. Um, most training programs start with training and then there's a uh, hope to get hired at the end of the program. We've turned that around and said, let's start with a job vacancy and then find the right people to fill it and then train them uh, mostly on the job uh, to become the skilled person and the valuable employee that that company wants them to be. Um, and the good news in that is uh, certainly in the manufacturing area, uh, advanced manufacturing area and with skilled jobs, those are not just good jobs. They're actually the start of a good career pathway for people to move on and progress to other uh, other positions in that organization and in other organizations as they move ahead. So, so it's a very positive story in that sense. So uh, companies get to fill the job vacancies they've got with the capable people they need um, and people who don't have those skills, that don't have all the skills that they need and are looking for them, can get them. Um, and the joy in that is they earn while they learn uh, through this program. So it's very different than, than, most other, than most other programs. We've been doing this for about six years now. Um, we've had a number of job positions, CNC machinist, uh, mold maintenance te technician, CNC operators, um, structural airframe assemblers. We've had about 600 trainees come through the program uh, with about 50 different companies. And the good news is we get about uh, over 90% success when we get the right people into the right jobs and train them well and properly. So it's a very good story in that sense. I love it. And I, I, I love the aspect that they're entering the job first and then they're training and learning while they're um, getting paid to do so. And that the industry is Absolutely. realizing that um, there's a need for that and there's a gap in, in the area and that they're willing to invest in that training. But 
uh, great for WBLC to see that and to create a program that's very niche that gets people employed and gets the gets to also bridge the skill trade shortage, especially as I look at um, the time that we're in um, during COVID. It's really promising to see that the manufacturing sector is still growing and there's still a demand and that um, you're looking to recruit applicants yeah. with a starting wage of $22 per hour. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, it depends on the company, obviously. What we certainly encourage companies to do is, uh, depending on where they are and what uh, what their own business is about, we say certainly twenty to twenty-two dollars an hour should be the rate that they're uh, that that uh, would be a reasonable offer to someone. We go to a good effort to try to make sure that we get the people who have, as I say, the aptitudes and the attitudes of the job. So we start this process by making sure that there's a good uh, alignment between the uh, those competencies, let's call them employability competencies that a company that the job needs and the employability competencies that the individual brings. And that we know is going to make for success because if people, I mean, we all know what it's like, not every job is for everybody. Uh, so if we find the folks who like a manufacturing environment, like building things, like doing things, like working with their hands, they have a bit of a math brain, they're problem solvers, they're happy to work independently and in doing that sort of thing. If that's their makeup, then we know this kind of thing is the right job for them. If it's not, that's fine. There are certainly lots of other jobs that they can move to. But So we try to make sure that there's that good fit between um, the, what the what the applicant brings and what the job requires the training and the technical stuff if they've got the right attitude and some motivation they can learn we know that um, and that's everybody's experience I see Rebecca you're shaking your head and it's uh, I think that's exactly the case maybe I can just comment for a minute on uh, on why we're trying to make a focus uh, to bring women into the trade into the skilled trades area um, we've had um, a number of women participate in the program, but it's the, uh, they've been few and far between. Um, I mean, clearly many of these skilled trades historically have been uh, populated mostly by men. There's no fundamental reason for that to be the case. Um, in fact, once companies learn about it, they actually in some cases prefer to have women for some of those jobs, just the nature of the uh, outlook on the approach and that sort of thing. But um, th the reality is we're ignoring, uh, we don't have enough skilled people to go around. Uh, if we're going to bring people uh, into the trade, where to uh, where to find them? Uh, there's a whole unserved population out there, of women, for whom this can be a very good job. Um, I can tell you for certain when I approach companies and say to them, we're taking a focus on women, um, are you okay with that approach? They say, absolutely, right? Uh, without exception, uh, there is no bar to that from a company perspective at all. So it's, uh, and I think Elizabeth and Rebecca, your testament obviously to that sort of thing. So it's a, um, um, it's, and it's the kind of work I think that is very suitable for, uh, for, uh, for people of all uh, types and, uh, situations. Well, thank you for for clarifying that. I mean, you are definitely uh, speaking to uh, an area that we're very committed to, and that's diversity and inclusion within the workforce. Um, and Rebecca, in particular, came um, from a program that was led through Women's Enterprise Skills Training of Windsor in partnership with St. Clair College that was aimed at getting more females into the trade. And Elizabeth was through a different program that, that was predominantly typically um, uh, male dominated recruits, but then um, there was a strong focus in getting more females. So I, I guess I'm going to turn the question to Rebecca and Elizabeth. We'll first start off with Rebecca and then move on to Elizabeth. Um, what was it about the program that interested you in considering you, uh, the, your application? And then once you got in, um, what motivated motivated you to continue in the field and what advice do you have for females that are tuning in right now and wondering is manufacturing the right industry for me and particularly am I interested in becoming a CNC machinist? Okay. Um, for myself, um, 
when I first saw the flyer, I think if it didn't say that it was specifically for women, um, I might not have even taken a second glance at it because to me, like I didn't know what a millwright was. It's for industrial millwright mechanic, the pre-apprenticeship program I took with a strong focus on CNC machining. So when I saw that, it was like foreign to me, but it did say specifically for women and I was looking to kind of restart uh, a career. So that actually is what piqued my interest because I was like, oh, this is something I can do. I don't even know what this is. And then of course you go to the computer and you start researching. And I figured out what it was and I was like, oh, wow, this actually sounds very intriguing. It immediately piqued my interest. And that's kind of how that whole thing initiated. I was a single parent and looking for a career to support my family. So going back to school full time just doesn't seem like an option. You're like, I'm going to be stuck in a financial spiral out of control for years before I start my career. Um, but this is super appealing because as mentioned, earn while you learn right you get to work full-time and you go to school twice a week at night which is a lot to juggle but definitely worth it for the career that you get at the end um, so it just checked off all my boxes there and not only that but totally piqued my curiosity which I feel like is so important um, as soon as I began doing the program um, I was hooked like I really it was so different than what I'd done before and they really start you off from like nothing. Like before that, I had taken a couple courses in high school, but that was 10 years prior. <laughs> I wouldn't call it experience. They teach you like the shop talk. So even going in, um, you know that decimal place uh, 001 is a thou. Like just things like that that you didn't know. And it just made you feel more confident. So when I was taking the program, um, since it was for Millwright with a focus on CNC, you kind of got a little taste of everything, which is one aspect I really liked. So a Millwright is a huge umbrella, and it covers um, basically a whole range of things. You touch on elect electricity a bit, you do um, a little bit of everything, and you run the manual machines. So that's the machining, and they even have some CNC machines you dabble in there was part of the course so I just became very intrigued I love being hands-on I was like yes this is for me and that determination is what you need so in the end when there was a job fair people see your passion they're like that's who we want working for us I had three job offers and I chose my company who I've been with ever since um, they've been really supportive so yeah I would definitely the biggest encouragement is if this is something that you want go for it because um, it's easy to feel like it's overwhelming, right? Um, I always had three kids working full time, going to school twice at night, but in the end, it was definitely so worth it. I wrote my ticket. I'm now a fully ticketed general machinist, and that's something that I will always have. Um, no matter what happens um, going forth, I will always be a Red Seal machinist. I can take that anywhere across Canada, and um, I have a skilled trade like a skill i didn't have before i've now acquired so i would definitely um, recommend it and just say don't give up if it something you're interested in go for it thank you and how much did you invest in your own training how much what would what, what cost would you say was your investment um for me specifically that depends on your sponsor and your employer um, but they did reimburse my tuition um, each year if I held a 70% grade average and the pre-apprenticeship program was also a free program It gave you all your tools. It supplied you with everything you need um, Not just tools not just financially But with just feeling like you could do it any question you had resume building everything they were there interview skills math upgrades they there was tutors at the college the college has so many programs to help you so every step of the way there's just support so financially didn't cost me very much maybe invest a few tools they did give you some but if you want a tool here or there it's specifically for the job you're doing that's pretty much it really interesting especially as we know that there's a lot of students that walk away with really high debt and having a hard time finding a job within their field if we look at the program being run through WBLC, they're actually giving you a job and then training you on the CNC machine, which they're paying you. And again, you have zero investment in your in your own training. So um, 
I, that's that's another reason why I love the skill trades um, and it, there's a demand. So thank you for sharing that. How about you, Elizabeth? I know your story was a little bit different because you were right out of high school. Yeah, I was, uh, I was right out of high school. I did first robotics in high school. So I had the opportunity of building robots in high school and working with my hands. And out of grade 12, I didn't know what I wanted to pursue in college at the time. I was looking at the programs and I'm like, I don't know what I want to pursue. But I saw the flyer uh, at the school on the wall. And I was like, this sounds incredible. I was looking at that. It's like, you like to work with your hands. And I was like, yes, I do. You like building <laughs> stuff. Are you, do you, yeah, I was looking at the program and I looked at the, um, what it was offering it was like free tools. Um, also tuition is free too as well. And I was like, this is a great opportunity for my life because for me, I wasn't born in this country and I, I didn't, my family, I didn't have money to go to school. I couldn't afford an education. So for myself, I saw this as an opportunity to go to school and I could actually get a job as well. And it was just an, it was just an amazing opportunity and I wanted to pursue it. And it was very hard for me at first, I'll admit to that too as well, because applying to this opportunity, a lot of people were discouraging me. They're like, Elizabeth, you're making the worst decision of your life. Because first of all, you're a woman, you're not gonna make it through and you're not gonna get in. But you know what, even regardless of that, I still decided to apply and I got in and I was so happy to start at St. Clair College. And the training was amazing, you know, just learning about machines and how they work and how they function and then being able to actually run them in class and make parts with your hands. It was amazing. And I was like, this is incredible. And I was like, I can't wait to start working. And I started working at Windsor Mold in 2017. And I've been there now for three and a half years. So for Windsor Mold, they're amazing. They're an amazing company. I'm very grateful to work with them. And they have actually um, paid for my education. So I ended up graduating last year from the General Machinist Program at St. Clair College uh, debt free. So they took care of that as well. And they've been so supportive of me. And I'm the, I was the only woman in my company that was a machinist. So for them, they even gave me opportunities to work with the men and always try their best to um, show me everything and train me. And I'm so, I'm right now I'm in the process of registering for my red seal. So it's been an amazing process and I'm so happy that I chose this career pathway and entering into machining. So, so what that advice, is my story. no, that's amazing. I love, you know, I love your story. It's uh, really, it continuously inspires me and energizes me to keep doing this work and advocating for more women to enter these fields. Um, but what advice do you have for females? You know, maybe they're uncertain and they're doubting if they, you know, they belong in the industry. Like what advice could you give them that you wish people gave you when you were starting out? For, for them, I would say just apply to the opportunity. It's out there. Just check it out. See how you like it too as well. And keep believing in yourself. It's important that you believe in yourself as a woman, that you can do this job because you know what? We have so many, there's so many things that we can offer for our companies. You know, we're really like many of us are great at math. Some of us are very good at visual skills. Like women have great visual skills. That's what companies constantly keep saying about women that work in these fields. So, it's, you know, and also you have a community out here from build a dream to uh, Wes as well that will support you. And even the women in the trade, like Rebecca has been someone that has supported me along this way. And I'm grateful to have such a great friendship with her. And, you know, having this community of women out there, we're here to support you along the way. We're your, we're your, we're your community and we're here to help you. If you ever need help or advice, come and talk to us. If you're curious more about what this trade is, feel free to, to message us too. Well, we're the we're more than happy to talk about our experiences and to share that with you. And on that note, for anyone that's tuning in, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please ask away. This is your chance to really learn more about the industry and how you can start your career um, in manufacturing. Um, and just to add to what Elizabeth says, said, Elizabeth has traveled across Canada speaking to large audiences with Build a Dream, but with the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, with the Windsor Economic Development Corporation, and really sharing her story and advocating to get more women and learning about Elizabeth's story and then learning about Rebecca's story. I mean, Rebecca was a single mom of with three kids. Um, Elizabeth had just finished high school. Both found themselves in manufacturing and continue to pursue this pathway. So it is a long-term 
opportunity for you to not only grow, but make the financial gains that will allow you to raise three kids or that allow you to, to not have to invest so much in education. And I love hearing the fact that you walked away debt free. Like I have to say, nothing against post-secondary. I'm a graduate from post-secondary, but I paid off my student debt three years ago and I graduated 10 years ago. So it's just <laughs> like in contrast, like you are so much more financially ahead than many people that are investing um, in their education. And, and um, Rod says this often, and I know that on uh, part of their program, this is not for everyone. And we're not trying to say that everyone should go into manufacturing. There are specific requirements that um, this program is, is looking for. And one is, some experience in manufacturing, um, some experience in being able to, to work with machinery or tools. So Rod, can you talk more specifically about the hard skills that in the background and experience that you're looking for for an applicant? Like for example, let's just say Elizabeth had applied right out of high school. Would her first robotics experience and her experience in some of the tech classes been enough for her to be considered a candidate? Yeah, I, and I think what we're looking for are people who have uh, demonstrated that they've got some comfort in that sort of an environment, that they like things that are uh, mechanical, that they've got, uh, uh, as you said, Elizabeth, a bit of a math brain, um, uh, need to think in 3D. If you're going to be a machinist, you got to be able to visualize things in that sort of sense. So um, uh, there's a... Uh, there's just a few questions that we, as I said, we ask people to think about. And if they can answer yes to most of those questions, then they can fit very well into that kind of a, and more importantly, actually, they'll actually enjoy the job. They'll get satisfaction out of it. I mean, I hear that in spades in both uh, Elizabeth and Rebecca and the fact that they really take great pride and great delight in what they're doing. So it obviously fits with the kinds of things that give them satisfaction. But those are also the things that make them, make them successful in that work. So it's um, those attributes those uh, that they bring are really critical. I mean, we look uh, when we do the assessment process that we put pe people through, we're looking for uh, three cognitive skills, uh, numeracy, verbal skills, three-dimensional thinking. We're looking for uh, about eight uh, different personal and relational competencies, energetic, drives for results, focus on self-discipline, assertiveness, friendly, teamwork, uh, all those kinds of things. And then business competencies, problem solving, planning, decision making, uh, focus on detail and quality, computer usage, a whole bunch of those kinds of things, and obviously a safety focus as well. So when we find people who have those kinds of uh, at aptitudes and attitudes, those are the ones that fit well with that job and that kind of working environment. Uh, and particularly a manufacturing environment. So to your question, what we're looking for are people who have demonstrated some affinity for those kinds of um, uh, that job environment, if I can say that. Um, I mean, if you, if you, uh, I used to say that uh, you, you hadn't hit the real world till you walk out back and smell cutting fluid, right? Um, I mean, that's just a machinist kind of a world in that sort of sense. So if people walk out and go, oh my God, what is this all about? Then that's fine. It's just not an environment that fits them. But if they walk out and they say, wow, this is great. Look at these machines. If I could actually help make those things run and work properly, if I could get the parts produced on, you know, uh, according to spec and uh, according to schedule, I'd be thrilled with that kind of thing. So we're just looking for people who've got some comfort in that kind of environment. It can come out of, of Oh gosh, anything from if you took your bike apart and put it back together again and all the pieces fit and it ran properly, then that's a pretty good sign, right? Um, so you don't necessarily have had to work in that kind of an environment, but you got to have some exposure to it and know that it's the kind of thing that will give you uh, satisfaction and reward uh, and that you'll be comfortable in it. So that's really what we're looking for. Uh, you don't need to know anything about it. Uh, um, you don't have to know that 001 is a thou. You don't have to know how to measure that with a micrometer. You don't have to know how uh, feeds and speeds on cutting on CNC machines. You can learn all of that. But if you've got the right uh, attitude and if you've got the right mentality for it, then you can and will learn and will help you do that through the program very successfully.
I have to say, I had the privilege of of being a part of Elizabeth and Rebecca's training experience. And I just remember their pride and joy in sharing their learning experience with me on a weekly basis and just the amount of exposure they were provided on the shop floor just really um, transitioned them into becoming highly skilled trades um, people that are now thriving in the industry. And even myself, I've had the opportunity to tour many manufacturing facilities. And they are apps, like in many cases, they're beautiful. They're not what I had originally anticipated yeah. when I walked through the door. They're just highly innovative investment in technology, um, yeah. just even the, the how clean it is. Um, yeah. and, and speaking of the, the CNC world, the machinist world, um, I I also found it interesting that so many things that are made are touched by a machinist um, th through their lifespan. And um, speaking about that, for those that are unsure, like what does a day in the life of a CNC machinist look like? Could could we maybe have Elizabeth or Rebecca highlight that and then highlight your like proudest moment on that machine? Rebecca, we'll start with you since you're smiling. It, okay. it seems like you have a story to share. <laughs> um, so Machina, so it's it's just interesting, as you were saying, uh, reminding me of accomplishments week by week. So it's funny to think about how far I've come. Mm -hmm. Like to now a day in the light, my life is not unusual. But at the beginning, it was so like invigorating. Every I was learning something literally every five seconds. I was like, whoa. Um, but basically, a day in the life of, I run a CNC lathe right now. So um, CNC, basically, I don't know if people are familiar with the manuals. So a manual mill or a manual lathe, they operate by moving a table and spinning a wheel. So CNC basically does that for you. You create a pre program for it, and it tells the machine where to move. So um, with a CNC machine, and I run a lathe, I'm working with um, round bars, um, I get a blueprint for the job. I check out my job, I make sure that everything matches. It's a material match, is it the right size? You do quick basic measurements. And then you assess the blueprint to see what tools you're gonna need. You can often do this while job's running in the machine. So if you have something set up, that's a time to look at the next job ahead and figure out what you're gonna need. You line up your tools, um, you measure everything and just do a quick check. You also can load the program up. I check through the program, make sure there's no errors, or oftentimes I have to write my own program. So depending on what's there, if it's a job that we're pretty familiar with, then we probably have something and it might need a little tweaking. If it's something we haven't seen, we might have to write the program. So then from there, let's say the job is finished from before, you set up a stop for it. Generally, if there's more than one, you get the right call it to hold your material and you enter it in the machine. And then from there, you set all your tooling and then you run the machine. So you have to each job you have to pick up where it starts and then it, it can go from there you watch it make sure it's going to be successful and then at the end you have to make sure as was mentioned that it's a specification so you want to check that print and see how detailed you have to be how accurate it has to be if it doesn't have to be accurate you don't want to waste time you want to be efficient you get it out within tolerance and then you measure do your own check and it goes off from there to either another operation or where people will um, send it off. So it's very exciting. I think I've gotten the opportunity to run CNC mills and lathes. So for me, um, anytime I get to run a new machine is always a highlight because um, I don't want to say I get bored quickly, but once I've mastered the machine, I'm like, okay, what's next? I want to see, I want to run more axes. I want to check out what that one's capable of doing. So I find it um, very exciting how you can always grow, that there's always something to learn within companies. What I'm doing at my company probably isn't at all what Elizabeth's doing or just anywhere. Um, it depends. Mold groups tend to work on huge molds. I often work on small parts, especially with lathes. So there's many different aspects to it and different things that you could be doing. And what's your end product? What parts oh, are you making? You. Can you hear me? Yeah, all of a sudden you're silent. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> Hello? No. Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me? Okay, maybe Elizabeth. Yeah. Or, 
Okay, I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move on to Elizabeth. Hopefully, Rebecca can get her sound back. Um, Elizabeth, what's your favorite part of working on the machine? My favorite part, for me personally, would be actually like I love for myself personally. I have to load the machine as well. I do operate the machine, so I get the piece of setup as well. I love watching the process, the finishing part sometimes too, because just seeing ever the machine cut the pieces and running around and just learning, doing your program. It's taking all your instructions and performing them. That is probably my favorite part of CNC in general and just machining. I just love seeing that my work, that all the work that I put into the program, all my numbers, everything that I've done is performed by the machine and watching the machine go through the process and cutting everything and then seeing the final product and holding it in my hand that is the most satisfying thing for me personally. I love it and I love the way you share it. Um, what is your end product? Our end product is a mold. So we make um, molds which are plastic components for cars. So we're talking about your dashboards, we're talking about your lights, anything plastic in your car, we make it. And these molds are huge machines. So we have all the parts that we're making, they go to a group called Mold Makers. These groups are people that built these components and put them together. So it's very important for us as machinists that our parts are uh, accurate, they're made correctly as well because everything comes together. And you find, it's amazing to see the final product, like all these pieces, all of them are functioning, seeing the molds move as well, it's amazing. So I'm sure the way you appreciate a car's model is completely different now that you work in the industry than it was before even being introduced to this world. Yes, it's, it is incredible because now you think about everything about the person who made the part. Because when you look at a car, you're like, okay, this is the final product. You know, you can drive a car. It's great. You don't really think about how it was made. You weren't <laughs> in the process of it in the beginning. So now I was part of that process. I can see the amount of work and I do applaud everyone out there in manufacturing. have a greater appreciation for tradespeople because it takes a lot of work to be able to even make these machines. And it's so much time with programming and learning the software. Machining is such a, it's just so much a variety and it's incredible to see how much work it takes to make this final product. It's just, you have a greater appreciation for things around you and the things that you see as well on cars too. That's amazing. So um, Rod, I know that you had some questions. We had chatted about some questions. Um, how about we move on to the pay and benefits? I know we touched on it briefly, um, what the starting pay on average could be. Um, can you talk, walk yeah. me through that process and also um, some of the benefits? Okay, we have, Rebecca, do we have you back? Yes, and I can hear you guys. I don't know what happened. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Welcome oh, well, back. <laughs> technology reigns supreme. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure, Noor. Um, so, I mean, the, the pay situation and the benefits obviously are dependent on the company. Uh, so for Rebecca, I'm sure her situation at Centerline is a little different than uh, than yours, Elizabeth, at, uh, at, uh, at Windsor Mold, but that's up to each company. What we want to do is to make sure that they're offering a at least a starting wage that is attractive for the very good, capable people and those that we've selected that we know can learn and do the job. Um, so we encourage them to get started at that kind of rate. But as you guys know, um, the opportunities thereafter are great. So after you've completed the program, in our case, it takes about six months. Um, and then companies will usually make some kind of pay adjustment as people move on and progress and become more proficient and more productive. Um, I mean, fully capable uh, CNC machinists, ones with experience, will be earning 35 or $40 an hour. I mean, that's a pretty decent wage. Tack on some overtime, tack on some benefits, uh, get some holidays that go with it, and it's a very nice uh, working environment. As we say, you can, uh, you can raise a family on that, as you're doing, Rebecca. Um, and that's, uh, that's obviously a, uh, an attractive part of it. And, and so it's, um, so it's a good job that pays very well. And as you said, the working conditions, uh, unlike what many people, uh, think and expect in a manufacturing environment is actually, uh, they're pretty good working environments in that sense. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, 
some shops are not uh, air conditioned, so it might get a little hot on a day like today. But uh, but that's uh, that's just uh, that's just part of the situation that we've got. So, but generally they're good jobs. But the pay is uh, is good to start, and and generally gets better as uh, as you progress in proficiency and as you move ahead in your uh, in your career. I mean, I know I was talking with a company the other day, um, and they actually had two of the first group of CNC machinist uh, trainees that we had. Uh, two of those guys have moved off to be uh, programmers, so they've moved up in their world. So we know that the opportunities are there for people who start to move on if they want to. They don't have to, but uh, if they want to move ahead and can uh, tackle the, the additional knowledge that's required for those other jobs. So whether you move into the quality area, you move into programming, move into design, move into wherever you can, can, can the lots of opportunities and companies are happy to make those opportunities available for people who are capable and, uh, and interested and want to move ahead. So, uh, so yes, good pay, I think, to start, um, but, uh, but more importantly, the opportunities are there to move on, uh, advance in that job, uh, increase your pay, and have a career opportunity that, uh, or career opportunities ahead of you that are actually quite appealing. So for those that are assuming that the manufacturing sector is in decline, um, what is your answer to them? Because I, I know before we got on this call, um, you had mentioned that you've already recruited multiple employers that are ready to yep. take on the yep. applicants that are accepted into the program. So what is yep. your response to those that are hesitating about entering the industry right now? Um, it's absolutely clear. Manufacturing as a broad category has, uh, has declined uh, over in terms of employment levels over many, many years. Um, but uh, you really have to differentiate between what I would call the advanced manufacturing part of the of the manufacturing industry and the broader based manufacturing industry. So the low skill, low paid job types of manufacturing activities, those have disappeared and they're likely to continue to disappear. Those aren't the jobs that we want people to have in, in Canada. We want the high skilled, um, more adventurous kinds of jobs. So I was actually reading an article in, uh, in the Globe and Mail today by Barry McKenna and he was making that point uh, so if you look at the number of jobs that have that have uh, the number of growth in jobs in uh, those advanced manufacturing sectors, uh, aerospace has grown by 45 percent over the last 10 years, um, automotive by 22 percent, um, uh, IT and uh, electronics by 17 percent, um, agri products have grown by 45 percent so there's real growth in those kinds of areas and as i said we continue to have companies that are growing uh looking to add new people the other factor to remember in all of this is that demographics are uh on the side of those who are looking for jobs these days because um any company we go to if they are candid about their own situation they'll say we've got I remember going to one company and he said, listen, half of the guys in my shop could walk out the door tomorrow and take a retirement package if they chose to. Some of them will, uh, some of them may stay on, but we're going to need new people coming into the, uh, into the manufacturing world. And what we're looking for are the people who have or can acquire the skills that they need to be the skilled help. So uh, those parts of the manufacturing industry that I'll generally call advanced manufacturing that rely on high skill, do research and development, uh, those are the ones that are in fact continuing to grow and grow very nicely and that will only continue as we move ahead. So nobody should be um, uh, distraught about the prospects for manufacturing. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we may have fewer people, but we have higher skilled people and manufacturing continue to grow and the output of that advanced manufacturing is growing faster than the employment rate. So it's a positive environment. And a lot of that stuff is, a, is an export market as well. So that's even more positive. Well, Canada is known as a leader in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, and that's something that we're continuously 
yep. invest into as a as a nation. And um, we have one of yes. some of the top companies across the world um, in advanced manufacturing here in Canada. So it is an industry yep. that's th thriving and growing. Yep, absolutely. Yep. No, it's a very positive story. So um, my last question to you, Rob, before I go back to Rebecca and Elizabeth, let's just say I'm an applicant. You sold me. I love it. I, I want to work in manufacturing. I want to work on the machine. I interview and I get accepted. Walk me through that journey once I get accepted. What does that look yep. like? Yep. So so the, f the first step in the process is when is for people to actually apply and go through an online screening test that we apply. It takes about 45 minutes. There are three parts to it. And uh, that gives us a pretty good and gives them a pretty good indication as to whether or not they've got those essential aptitudes and attitudes that make them a good fit for the job. As I said, if they don't, that's not neither negative or positive. That's just the reality of that person and their situation, uh, what they bring to the uh, the aptitudes and attitudes that they bring. So if you come through that screening process, uh, then there's an interview which kind of helps round out uh, that understanding of what uh, those aptitudes and attitudes are that the individual brings. And then we look at those in comparison to what's needed in the job. We actually have an industrial psychologist who looks at each and every one of those to try to make sure that we've got a good fit between that individual and the job situation. So if all of that is positive, then uh, we'll work with you to get you to get those candidates out to the right company. Um, and again, it depends on where the candidate is, where the company is, uh, travel situation, that sort of thing. There's no point in our case if we're working in the GTA, the greater Toronto area, uh, if we've got a candidate in Mississauga offering them a job in Pickering isn't going to work. So we need to find them a job that's going to be closer at hand in the, the Mississauga area and that sort of thing, right? So we'll line those up and then help them get ready for the interview. Um, if they need a little bit of coaching in that sort of sense, we'll help them get, uh, get ready for, and then send them out to the company uh, for the job interview. Um, and then out of that, the company will make the hiring decision. Um, and then they can, uh, now the program may not officially start, let's say for two weeks after their interview, uh, the company can hire them at that point and start them to, uh, to work and get familiar with the work environment, or they may wait until the start of the program. So, um, so it's, uh, the program officially starts on a, uh, on a set date. So it's a program of screening. Uh, out to companies to interview, get hired, and then start your program. So once they get hired, what's the training program like? Is it on the job? Um, is it virtual? What What am I expecting once I'm hired? Well, clearly there's there's some, what do we say, basic knowledge that you need, how to use micrometers, how to use measuring instruments, uh, understanding how to read drawings if you haven't done that before. So there's a whole bunch of basic knowledge. And what we're doing is uh, enabling people to learn that uh, through e-learning. So they're actually in their workplace, but they'll take some time every day to go into a training room at a computer workstation, whatever it may happen to be, and spend some, some time e-learning. They then, uh, there's also some shop floor assignments that they'll do so that when they've done a chunk of the e-learning, and there's probably about 10 modules might take 80 or 90 hours in total over maybe a couple of months. So they're actually working, but spending some time learning each day doing that sort of thing. We'll also have a few days in a training shop that we'll take them to partway through, through that initial learning part of the program uh, to give them some more hands-on stuff. They'll actually um, operate a machine, a mill or a lathe, or both probably. Um, download a program, the kind of thing that you were talking about, Rebecca, where you, you got to do, do the job setup. It may be a simple job, but uh, uh, just a three axis machine or whatever. But um, they'll download a program, set up the job, run the part, and uh, make sure it's correct. But a simple job. So um, so there's a, a e learning to give them the basic theory, uh, a little bit of practical on a training shop basis. Uh, but all through that time, they are also learning on the shop floor. And that's really, this was always my view. I come out of the aerospace industry, as I said, and uh, been in and around companies for the whole of my career. And to me, 
the best place for people to learn is on the shop floor. You've got the experts there who know what they're doing. You've got the range of uh, machinery. You've got the range of parts. You've got a real world situation to kind of work in. And uh, that's where people can learn best. But they need to do that on an organized and structured basis. So uh, remember in all of this, uh, what's driving the learning process is what we call the technical learning outcomes. So those are the competencies that people require to have to be a competent machinist. So when the trainer on the shop floor, the company uh, expert is helping a trainee learn, they're learning uh, those TLOs that, uh, that are specified for the job. How did we determine what those TLOs need to be? We sat down with a bunch of company experts and they said, here's what they need to know and be able to do to be a capable CNC machinist level one, right? So, uh, so everybody's being guided. So the e-learning process, the training shop effort, and all of the learning on the shop floor is driven by those technical learning outcomes. We're all marching to the same drum, uh, which is actually, uh, again, a big difference with our program. Companies have trained on a casual basis and on an informal basis forever, but it was a, well, we say a, a, an inefficient process and not a very helpful process. Mm -hmm. It was kind of throw people out on the shop floor, uh, hope they learn something. And uh, uh, if they did, then fine. And if they didn't, well, we'll have to do something about that. So not a very good process. So what we're doing takes that informal process, makes it formal and structured. And then the final piece of the process is we actually do certification so that we have an independent assessment as to whether or not the trainee has actually mastered adequately all of those technical competencies that are required in order to be able to be a proficient and productive CNC machinist level one. That's a start level is not uh, complete in that sense. But uh, so you put all of that together, the screening, the, the learning that goes on, the practical learning on the shop floor, certification to verify that they've in fact learned what's required to be learned. Um, and you get a good uh, you get a good outcome. And as I said, the benefit is, uh, so this goes back to what um, uh, Rebecca and Elizabeth were talking about. Um, it's really helpful if you can be confident at the start that you can get through this and be successful because it's for many people it's a whole different area it's a new experience it's a new type of work activity but what we can say to people is if you make the effort and you clearly have to make the effort um, but you can be successful and we know that 92 percent of those that start the program can be successful uh, if they're willing to put in the effort so uh, put all of that together and it's a very positive kind of a thing from everybody's perspective. Companies are happy to spend the time because they know that they're not wasting their time. They're getting a good result from that and the indiv individual can be confident that if they choose to put the effort in, they can be successful and have a good job and a good career. And what's the whole training process? What's the length of time? Once I get hired and I begin the training, how long would that typically take? Um, it's as fast as, as the trainee and the company can get there um, because it's not okay. time dependent, it's outcomes dependent. So if we've got somebody who has to bring some background uh, in the job necessarily, uh, then they can get it done quickly. Nominally, we say for a CNC machinist, we started by saying it was um, roughly six months. Uh, we're finding some people are getting there in four months. Some people are taking five and a half months, but that or six and a half months. But that's really dependent on how. <clears throat> so remember, if people are learning in a work environment, uh, the work environment isn't being organized to support their training. The work environment is being organized to get production out the door, meet schedule, get revenues and do what businesses are there to do. So sometimes the training opportunities don't uh, come along as uh, conveniently as they might from a training perspective. Uh, but if they do, then the trainee can get there as quickly as the company can uh, can put those training opportunities in place. But nominally for the CNC machinist program, it's been six months. We're actually finding with another program that we're running where we've uh, started with the e-learning uh, and this is the other side of the, uh, 
this is the mold maintenance technician. So those are the folks who put the molds together or take them apart or clean them and do whatever. So um, it's the other part of the mold making uh, business. Uh, we thought initially that would be seven months. It's actually turning out to be closer to five months. So it can get there. So people can get there as quickly as, uh, as they choose to get there. Once they've demonstrated that they're competent, we're done. So it's, uh, but nominally, I would say count on five to six months being normal for this program. Wonderful. And how many applicants are, will you be accepting into this program? Well, at the, the moment, this is, uh, we've got uh, funding support from the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development. Um, and we've got uh, 15 uh, places uh, to fill in this program. So we'll have two groups of seven or eight, I would think. Um, but um, uh, that's just a start at this point. We're hoping that once we get this uh, up and running, up running and demonstrate the effectiveness of it, that we'll actually be able to get funding to do many more. Uh, earlier programs, we had, uh, gosh, 120 and then 80. So we've trained, I think, about this point, about 250 machinists. So wow. the demand is out there from a company perspective um, and the opportunity is there for lots of people who are looking for jobs and looking to get uh, get skills. So uh, we're ready to do more. Uh, we just need to find a way to get the resources to make that happen. So, but at the moment it's 15. So for those that are tuning in and listening to this episode, I promised Rod and Wayne and Paul Coleman, who introduced me to this wonderful organization, who's committed to getting more women into the industry, that we would get some 15 female applicants that will love working in manufacturing and that are thriving and interested in not only pursuing a rewarding career, but getting paid really good money with great benefits and growth opportunities to make it happen. So if you're interested, prove to the industry that women belong and women are really interested in pursuing these occupations and go to www workbasedlearning.ca to fill in the online application. You can also visit our website at www.webuildadream.com um, because we also have the flyer out there and we can connect you to, to um, the application and kind of also help walk you through the application process. And Elizabeth and Rebecca have offered their support in answering questions as well in showcasing how they've thrived and been able to really financially build their um, their their family situation by just entering the trade and you heard their stories um, they're very proud of what they do so elizabeth and rebecca what final comments do you have so that we can encourage more females to see that they belong in this industry and that they can be as successful as you both are and how can we reach that 15 applicant number that will really thrive in the industry? I'll start with um, Elizabeth. So okay, or adding, the money thing, adding on to the money thing, <laughs> I didn't just walk away debt free. I also got a house, um, a car, and I have benefits for my children. Um, so my daughter got a whole bunch of mouth stuff done and it was a large amount of that was covered. So it's not just been, not only do you work for three years, get, get a diploma from college at the end while working full time, getting paid, my work, my tuition was reimbursed, but I also in that time bought my vehicle, good old minivan and uh, a house. So it's pretty incredible. Um, that you're not just walking away with no debt, you're also walking away with um, everything you need to kind of get life going. Well, depending how financially good you are with your money, but <laughs> it's possible, <laughs> it's definitely possible. Great. So that was really exciting. Uh, thank you for that, and Elizabeth? And like, and like I'm saying, like I'm saying it's, you, you, don't have not, you don't have anything to lose, honestly. It's free, let's keep that in mind. Even if you were to change your mind and pursue something else later on in life, you have how many years of experience? You have a full-time job. You worked for how many years? You went to school for free. You have your you have zero debt. You can pursue anything you want in your life. And honestly, this is a learning experience. Take it as a learning experience. Grow from here. Take as much as you can from the trade. Learn as much as you can in your life. Keep learning. That's the only way you'll be successful in life is that to keep 
pushing yourself and keep growing in your career pathway, you will be successful and you will have everything that you want in your life. It's up to you and what you want and how you're gonna pursue this path, but take it as a learning experience. And there's so many opportunities out there in the world. This is just another opportunity to improve your life and to help yourself or your family, whoever, whoever you're doing this for, keep pushing yourself and believe in yourself along the process as well. And you will be successful. Amazing. <laughs> and just even to add, absolutely wonderful. Yep. Absolutely wonderful. And to add to that, the life skills, the ability to tinker at home and to fix things at home and to build things at home. Those are lifelong skills that are generational. And then you can pass on to your kids and pass on to your family. So I, I would, couldn't have said it better than Rebecca and Elizabeth. Um, it's why that I often call on you to share your journey and your story. It's very powerful. It shows the different places we all are in life, but how we can all find ourselves in a very rewarding, financially rewarding career um, in an industry that has been underrepresented by females for so long. But there's so much commitment to diversifying that workforce. And if we had more time, I would have loved to chat with more, more with Rod, which we could do at a later date, about his investment in not only getting women to manufacturing, but he talked about briefly about being in the aerospace in, um, industry where he led some yep. initiatives to get more females in aerospace. So not only are you entering a rewarding career, working with WBLC, you're working with an organization that's committed to your success and to diversifying the workforce. And I think that speaks volumes to the opportunities that they're going to provide for you once you work with them and go through their e-learning training. So. Again, it's www.workbasedlearning.ca. They're very open to answering questions. Again, you can call on Build a Dream or Rebecca or Elizabeth for more information. Um, Rod, is there any final statements you want to make? Things that I may not have touched on during this interview? Um, I think the uh, enthusiasm that you hear from Rebecca and, uh, and Elizabeth just speak volumes about it. Uh, what I can say is if you have that kind of enthusiasm and, uh, and interest, uh, the program that we're offering that's available to people uh, will get you there uh, into a, uh, what is a growing industry with a stable job, uh, with uh, a, good, uh, a good job to begin with skills that are transportable and transferable and uh, a rewarding a career ahead of you that can build a, that can build a good life for people. So, um, and there's absolute receptivity, in fact, keenness to have more women in, uh, in the manufacturing sector, in the advanced manufacturing industry. So uh, the opportunity is there, take it, run with it. And uh, if you have the same kind of attitude as Rebecca and Elizabeth do, you absolutely will succeed and we're happy to help you do that. Wonderful. Um, well, that wraps up this segment. Um, for those that are tuning in that are from Windsor and wondering, well, is there an opportunity for me in Windsor to consider that are pursuing the manufacturing sector. I know that Women's Enterprise Skills Training of Windsor and St. Clair College currently have uh, opportunities for you to enter the pre-apprenticeship training program that both Elizabeth and Rebecca come from that is a different than the WBLC, but it's an opportunity for you to access it in the Windsor, Essex area. And for those that don't know, Windsor is known for the manufacturing sector um, that's thriving and growing. So make sure to visit um, www.westofwindsor.com. They uh, are more than happy to also speak to you and their application is now open. Also, the program is free and can lead you to Centerline or Windsor Mold or some of the other great companies that we work with in the Windsor area. The WBLC program at this time is only available in the GTA area, but there is um, opportunity for it to potentially grow across the province. So keep in touch with us. Um, and if you're from a different community and you're tuning in and you're wondering, you know, I really love this interview. I want to consider the sector. Reach out to us because we can connect you to some of our other partners from across the province to see what programs are available for you. Um, I take a lot of pride and joy in speaking to women in the industry. I'm very thankful to have hundreds of females that I look up to like Rebecca and Elizabeth that not only thrive in their industry, but use their experience to build up the industry. And one of the things, Rod, I often say to companies is if the one, the, if you recruit your first female, 
be sure that they will bring so many other females along with them because it's all about building the workforce and building opportunities for all of us to succeed. So once again, thank you so much for your partnership. I look forward to continuing our work with WBLC and Rebecca, Elizabeth, always a joy hearing your story. And thank you to all that. Absolutely. Tuned in. Yep. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon.